here we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Kevin Connors. We have a number of questions to get through on this Zoom call. So um, let's get at it right away. So dealing with weight loss issues, using organ concentrations uh, in supplements. I'll explain that. What are tumor-associated macrophages? Changes in your stool, traveling with the rife, and wound care are the questions that I received. Again, try to get your questions in early uh, if you can so we can get them into this, or you can ask them when we're online. But again, we'll, you're muted. Make sure you unmute yourself if you have a question as we get through this. So the first question about dealing with weight loss. How do you deal with weight loss? So weight loss, uncontrolled weight loss with cancer is called cachexia. So uncontrolled weight loss with cancer is called wasting syndrome or cachexia. That's typically if you're losing two to four pounds a week and you're not had changed your diet, you're not trying to lose weight, you're in a state where you're well below your normal weight, your desired weight, and you can't seem to put the brakes on that weight loss. What are there things to do? Now, I did share a whole video and blog post on this, so do search for that on our uh, blog as well. But just briefly, some of the things that would be beneficial is marijuana. So marijuana can be really beneficial using medical marijuana in a case of cachexia. Why? Because one of the things that marijuana does, using it as an edible or even smoking marijuana, can cause a person to uh, uh, have an increased appetite. So medical marijuana, the side effect that can increase a person's appetite can give a person the munchies that has been known to set, say. And getting an increase in appetite is hard because usually with cachexia, it's not that the person is eating 3,000 calories a day and can, is still losing weight. They have other issues that are going, are going on. They're, they're um, nauseous. They're not feeling well. They're having a plate put in front of them of a meal and they're able to eat a few bites. They just can't feel like they're eating. It can't eat anymore. Well, using marijuana can decrease nausea, can increase appetite, can decrease pain, can increase rest. So it can increase the, the depth of sleep that you're getting. So that could give a person more energy by using medical marijuana. So it has some benefits there. And then also doing some exercise, even if you're confined to bed, getting some five pound weights and doing some arm curls. If you can stand up, doing some squats, stimulating large muscle groups is very beneficial with cachexia. Because if you're stimulating large muscle groups by doing arm curls, if you can curl 10 pounds or 15 pounds or 20 pounds, do so. It's very beneficial. You're calling on the need for glucose in the muscles to make ATP, to make energy, to use the muscles. It steals ATP, it steals energy, it steals glucose away from the cancer. It can be very beneficial to help with um, muscle wasting syndrome. IV nutrition can be beneficial. So if you're at a place where you could get IV vitamin C, you could also get IV nutrition, IV vitamins, that can be helpful. Even IV fluids can be helpful in these cases. Drinking protein shakes. But again, most people that are in a state of cachexia are like, yeah, I made a protein shake for my husband, but he only drank a few sips of it and he just won't drink anymore. That's where medical marijuana has its benefits because it can increase that appetite. So do go back and watch the video on the blog for more information on that. That could be helpful. Next question. What's your take on using bovine organ concentrate? So a bovine organ, organ concentrate is an organ tissue. So organ tissue became very common use, a nutraceutical back in the 1960s, really. Maybe even before that, some companies came out with it. I know Biotics Research and Standard Process were the two companies that really started using organ concentrates. Um, they can be extremely beneficial. So one of the belief systems with organ concentrates is that when an organ is, let's say, hurting. So let's say 
your uh, thymus gland needs help to keep up. So one of your things that your thymus gland does is it helps stimulate immune function. So your thymus gland may need help in keeping up with the immune response, let's say. Your thymus gland actually secretes messenger RNA. Well, a lot to, to be heard about messenger RNA this last year with these vaccinations. Well, messenger RNA is made by your body. So we're not talking about a messenger RNA drug that's called a vaccine that's injected in you to do bad things to your cells. Your, your healthy cells release messenger RNA to tag something that will be helpful for that cell. So messenger RNA travels to your parotid gland. It's released in your saliva. And when you are exposed to any nutrient that's going to help that organ, that messenger RNA tags that nutrient from the saliva as it travels down to your stomach, tags it as you absorb it, and it will help bring it to that organ to help that organ heal. The other benefit of glandulars is that if a person has an autoimmune attack on a certain gland, let's say they have an autoimmune attack on the thyroid, by you taking thyroid glandulars, you're actually, the autoimmune attack is happening partly on that organ glandular that you're consuming and not on the thyroid itself. So it can help uh, calm down in an autoimmune attack. But we're not treating autoimmune disease here. We're treating cancer. So can organ glandulars be beneficial for a cancer? So let's say if a person has ovarian cancer, can taking this product like Cytozyme F be beneficial where it has uh, or ovary tissue in it. Um, there's, I did write a blog post about this several years ago using organ glandulars for cancer. There's um, a lot of, uh, there's several studies that are out there and there's a lot of theory that's out there that it can be beneficial by using the glandular of the tissue that you have the cancer with that it can help the body respond better and help that tissue heal better. So um, has it been proven out with our testing? Not always. We do use these products. I like Bionics Research glandulars, uh, especially because they're all, um, all their glandulars also have uh, superoxide dismutase and catalase with it, which are really strong antioxidants. They help protect the glandular. Uh, for many years beyond the expiration date, but they also help protect the glandular substance when it's brought into the body. And if it is brought to the tissue site, especially for cancer uh, cells, let's say if I have cancer of my ovaries and I'm taking ovarian tissue here, the cytosine F, um, then it's going to be brought there with the SOD and catalase. So you have that antioxidant uh, benefit that you're, that you're carrying directly to the cancer itself. So I'm a big fan of using uh, uh, glandulars. Now, the argument that people say is, well, this is bovine tissue and I'm supposed to be off of meat. Um, don't, you don't need to worry about this. This is organ tissue and this is not uh, muscle tissue of the, of the cow. So bovine means cow. This is also taken from organically grown cows um, no, they're still exposed to chemicals no matter what you do, but they're as clean as you can get. Um, so uh, Bionic Research has a very strong uh, reputation with their glandulars and they're a company that I trust a lot. They've been doing this for many, many years. So bovine organic glandulars are great. The problem is, is they don't have them for everything. Standard or, um, Biotics has the greatest um, array of them in, in their um, in their stock, um, but they don't have them for every single tissue, uh, but they have uh, maybe about 15 different tissue glandulars, so they can be very beneficial. Uh, typically from a functional medicine standpoint, glandulars are used to help stimulate that organ. Using thyroid glandulars can be very helpful with a person with hypothyroidism. Using adrenal glandulars can be very helpful for somebody who has, you know, dealing with stress issues, dealing with low thyroid issues, this product is thigh. This doesn't stand for thyroid. This stands for thymus. So this would be an immune stimulator, the cytozyme thigh. Um, and the F 
stands for female here, and that has ovary, has pituitary, has hypothalamus, uh, ovary, and I think uterine tissue in there. Um, but that's a great balance formula for women. So glandulars can be great tissues, uh, things to add to their product line. Uh, here's a question, what are TAMs? Uh, I think the person who asked this question um, watched my video on TAMs. These are uh, tissue associated, tumor associated macrophages. Uh, so just briefly, you can go at, to the blog post and search for tumor associated macrophages and you'll see a 20 minute video on this. But real briefly is that uh, there's been numerous studies that show that cancers uh, typically heart cancers, can uh, pull in macrophages. So macrophages are part of your white blood cell system that is supposed to fight cancers and help kill cancers. Well, tumors can basically recruit macrophages and make them work for the tumor. And they can assist the tumor in increasing blood supply to the tumor. They can assist the tumor to fight off other T cells um, that are and natural killer cells that are trying to kill the cancer. So these macrophages basically go to the dark side, if you want to say it that way. And it's, it's through different chemical reactions, through a uh, process of the tumor utilizing VEGF, which is vascular endothelial growth factor, and through hypoxic conditions, so conditions of decreased oxygen. So that's why one of the reasons, one of the small reasons why we don't want our cancer patients wearing masks because any state of hypoxia is going to increase the formation of tumor-associated macrophages, which are called M2 macrophages. It's another name for macrophages that have been recruited by a cancer to work for the cancer and work against the immune system. These tumor-associated M2 macrophages spit out all these cytokines, these nasty inflammatory cytokines down here in the right side of this yellow box down here, IL-4, IL-13, IL-6, highly inflammatory chemicals that then block the immune response. And that's not a good thing. And in the video, if you go to that uh, blog post and watch the video, it's... Uh, um, there are some very specific things that a person can do that you, many of our patients are already doing using green tea extract, resveratrol, using curcumin, uh, any of the um, anti-inflammatory flavonoids, using immune stimulants, which all of our patients are doing, will help block the formation of these M2 tumor-associated macrophages. So it'll keep the macrophages in this M1 state. It'll help deliver macrophages in the M1 state. They're the good guys. They're the ones helping kill the cancer. These M1 state macrophages will help kill cancer. And, will, and if you continue on those type of products, those that type of nutrition, interesting, the study is, this, these studies have been done to, to, they're proving that this is taking place. And then they're trying to find pharmaceutical drugs that they're trying to create pharmaceutical drugs that will block this push from M1 state, good guys, to the M2 state, bad guys, the tumor associated macrophages from taking place. But we already have in our arsenal all these specific nutritional products that block VEGF, that block hypoxia, that block these other pathways, these HDAC3 pathways that will help stimulate these and block these CCN3, PGE2, CCL2, these other pathways we already have in our arsenal things that will block the pathways from moving M1 to M2 and will stimulate moving M2 back to M1, pushing the bad guys back to the good guys and will block the the production of all these bad inflammatory cytokines down in the yellow box on the right-hand side. So most of our patients are taking you know, things that will already do this. If you want more information, you can watch that uh, more lengthy video where I go into detail on those products. Those are tumor-associated macrophages. 
just another reason why, why, you know, why is my immune system not killing the cancer? It's the cancer is so smart. It's recruiting the, 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 the guys that are supposed to come and kill it to be its friend and work on its behalf. Um, kind of like our, uh, our political system today. So if you can think of it that way, then you can understand tumor associated macrophages. Next question. My stools have been hard these past couple of weeks, which is abnormal for me. I'm still having two to three bowel movements per day, but I'm having a lot of gas, which is very embarrassing. Any advice? So whenever you're having hard stools, the first thing you think of is, uh, are you drinking enough water? Okay, because if you're dehydrated, you could have hard stools. Um, uh, digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid are another first thing you think of. So the other thing that will help pull water into the bowel is magnesium. So the reason why a person takes magnesium and has looser stools is because you have a need for magnesium in your body. Matter of fact, probably of any other nutrient there is, magnesium is utilized in more metabolic pathways than anything else. However, any excess magnesium will just be dumped back into the colon. And magnesium, because it's a positive ion, will draw water to it. So if you take more magnesium than you need, then you will dump it into the colon. It draws water and you will loosen your stools. So one of the easiest way, if you have real difficult um, stools, you have hard stools, constipation, my first go-to is add magnesium. Start taking some magnesium before bed. You'll usually have looser stools just because it'll draw water, but you can't be dehydrated either. So make sure you're drinking enough water also. You can have hard stools, and especially this last hint about lots of gas, because you're not getting proper digestion. So if you're getting a lot of gas you're getting food that's sitting in your colon and your small intestine longer than it should, and it's fermenting, and then that fermentation is causing gas. So different foods will ferment quickly. That's why eating beans or something like that are gassy foods, quote unquote, because they ferment quickly. So um, you have to ask yourself, what's your diet like? Am I eating a lot of these foods that ferment? Or is food just staying in my colon longer? Be they have a longer intestinal tra transit time. Therefore, it has more time to ferment and I'm not getting enough digestive enzymes added. So adding digestive enzymes, adding HCL, hydrochloric acid, with each meal when you eat your food is when you take the HCL. You can take digestive enzymes right then too, but you can take digestive enzymes anytime. Make sure you have enough water co uh, uh, consumption and then make sure you add magnesium. So those are the things that I would suggest for that issue. Next question. Do I need to take my rife on the plate as a carry-on or can I check it through to my destination? I've done both. So you can take it with, at, with you on a care, as a carry-on if you don't trust how, you know, if you have a real small bag that you're, that you're checking and you don't trust how it's thrown around, uh, it's pretty hardy. If you wrap it in a, in a sweatshirt or something like that and then stuff it between your clothes, it's, it's, you're not going to have really probably any issues with breaking. The bulb is certainly not going to break. There's times that I did not have a checked luggage, so I just brought it on as a carry-on as well. Often you get... Um, it gets beeped and they look at you and ask questions on, you know, what is this thing? And I try to explain it to them and then they look cross-eyed to you and uh, hand it over back to you. So they could tell by the scan that there wasn't a bomb or something as they x-rayed it. Um, but sometimes out of curiosity, they've asked me what it is. Sometimes they had never even asked me what it was at all. So either way, whatever's more convenient for you, um, we've had, you know, we have people, you know, travel home with their rifle all the time. We've never, ever to this point had an issue with it. Next question, because this tumor is continuing to drain, this is not a picture of the patient's tumor. I just pulled that off the internet. It's continuing to drain. Do I need to stay out of the ocean, out of pools or out of hot tubs? If you have an open wound, you really should never go in a hot tub and get that open wound wet. 
So if it was in your foot, it'd be pretty hard to stay out of a hot tub if you're uh, if you have an open wound on your foot. Um, as far as a pool, I would still be careful not to get it wet. You don't want to introduce infection to an open wound. That's the whole point. You know, if you're going to go in the ocean, oh, it's salt water. It's going to sting. It's not going to be clean. Um, it's going to contain all sorts of particles. Um, yeah, I would not let an open wound get wet or I would try to prevent it. Now, I put, pulled up this picture because there's different gauzes that you could use. This is obviously just a piece of uh, gauze that will absorb fluid and it's put on with tape. This would not be a good piece of gauze to put on um, going into trying to keep an open wound wet, uh, dry. But there are plastic Ized gauze with tape on the outside that you could easily put over an open wound, depending on how big the wound is and where it is, just to not that you want to go underwater with it, but that it would keep it protected should water splash on it. So I wouldn't, you know, you know, if you have a wound on your breast and you want to go in the water up to your belly button or a little bit higher, and you're not going to splash around or something, I would, I would for sure do that. It'd be very therapeutic but I'd be careful, I would be careful not to get it wet.